Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the show. Today, my guest is Diana Holden of Adventure Over Addiction. Diana, how are you today? Oh, and for whatever reason, I didn't hear what you said there. <laughs> That's okay. We'll get it. We'll get it. We have the music to, to blend in into the background here. Um, yes. So, Diana, thank you so much for joining us, joining me. Pleasure to talk to you. You know, I want to get into just, I guess, how we met. So as with uh, the majority of my guests, it seems it's like in the Instagram sober community, it's fantastic. And I came across your guy's store. Yeah. Adventure over addiction. That is the, uh, the Instagram handle. And it's also adventure over addiction.com. So let's get into it. I want to uh, just hear a little bit about the business, how it's been going. Uh, we'll start from the beginning the way, what was the genesis of this idea adventure over addiction? Good question. So I wanted to first start by saying congrats on almost, I think you're 48 hours away from a big day. Is oh, that correct? thank you. Thanks for <laughs> noticing. Yeah, I sure am. Yeah. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, so congrats. Uh, so a, a little bit about adventure over addiction. Um, so I guess since I've been in Colorado, I've come into different sort of paths crossing that um, blended with the big idea of adventure over addiction, which is a lifestyle movement, right? We're, we're coming, I think we're on the cusp of a big part of a lot of people wanting to get sober. They're curious about it. They're starting to dabble in it. I mean, January is a huge month. Sober October is a huge month. And yeah. so, um, I, as it kind of started to evolve, I met my husband, my now husband, but we had met and he was um, just becoming uh, sober and working through his recovery process. And we talked a lot about how we wanted to help people, but we just didn't know how. And adventure was a theme of my life. Uh, his uh, past addictions had kind of helped evolve his story. And so we started spitballing ideas and mm. that kind of evolved from um so yeah, that's the gist of it. <laughs> yeah, that's super cool. And right before we got started, I was asking you sort of what sort of timeline you've been on. So mm -hmm. I gathered uh, it's it's been about two years in the making. Like you said, you were spitballing mm -hmm. with uh, and so, what's your husband's name? I, I Tyler. Shout out for Tyler there. Awesome. Um. <laughs> so yeah, very cool. I t completely agree with you. There, the sober curious is sort of the buzz term, and mm -hmm. you know, folks that are conscious conscious drinking. Uh, that type of thing is definitely a big thing. I totally agree. And, you know, I think there's a lot of that coming out of that pandemic, right? There was a lot of people that were sort of forced to look at themselves in a different way and become a lot more aware of some certain patterns and such. And I, yeah, that, that, I completely agree with you on that. Back mm -hmm. to your, uh, back to your guys' business though. So about two years in the making, um, what was the decision to make it a like a clothing store like I'm to me I'm viewing it as like it's like that whole recovering out loud thing like wear it and like get people talking about it and it's beautiful fashion as well <laughs> thank you thank you um that's a good question so the idea actually was not clothing to begin with um it started as we were heading on a wake surfing trip uh, down in Pueblo, Colorado, and we were going to go wake surfing for the day and uh, something happened and it, it led to a bigger conversation of what we wanted to see, um, what helped us, what we wanted to see help other people. And um, it ideally in the long run, the goal is to have eventually adventure over addiction be this place where we take people out on adventures who are in recovery because when you're recovering community is huge right if you do not have that community you're the likelihood of you staying sober getting sober and staying sober is very difficult mm -hmm. if you don't yourself surrounded by like-minded people mm -hmm. um, the other aspect of that is building confidence and self-confidence self-awareness which all happen when you're putting yourself in extreme situations such as mm -hmm. high 14ers or yeah. you know doing, rock climbing things like that that yeah. that we do and and a lot of people will never have the opportunity will never take the opportunity to experience it because they think oh I can't do that mm -hmm. but we want to provide people provide um, other people with 
that opportunity to try those things and then um, build a community. So the long run goal is to be able to do that. And we started off thinking um, out of the gate, okay, nonprofit, let's go, we can do this. And mm -hmm. it's so much bigger and more difficult than what we could accomplish in that moment. Yeah. Um, like we were talking about, I like to do it all. I wanna know yeah. how to do thing before I ask somebody else to do it for me. Mm -hmm. Starting a nonprofit is a big task. And yes. for anybody, I give them major kudos. They're yeah. amazing. Um, <laughs> I, <laughs> yeah. yeah Where the idea is to one day be able to provide that, but we needed to step back a lot. And that's where we we said, okay, well, we'll just start wearing it out loud, right? And yeah. and get that idea out there that um and, and get the conversation going. And it has helped because I do have people reach out, not just on my business page, but on my personal page, because sometimes I, I just will wear the shirt or something. Mm. Oh, so you're sober. And I, yeah, I am. Oh, and cool. Tagline. It's interesting to them. And, you know, for a lot of people, and I'm sure you've heard this, oh, I can never do that. Well, you mm. can't. <laughs> and so yeah. it gets the conversation going uh, as far as um, just helping people understand it is possible. There's a different way to to live life. Mm -hmm. uh, and we want to provide that we want to be advocates for that. Yeah, beautiful. You know, there's so many parallels I find um, between just like adventure, the the the, the idea of adventure and, you know, mm -hmm. getting out of the to the fringe of your comfort zone and expanding That's like the familiarity of like, what you may perceive as anxiety with your nervous system and, and sitting with that and in, in, in a safe mm -hmm. spot, like you say, with a group of people that that have been there before you. So like to me, yeah, absolutely. Like going on like a, you know, a mountain trek is kind of similar. There's a lot of parallels and overlap to like the, the recovery experience too, isn't there? Yeah, there is. And um, something that I, I learned at one point during a class that I was taking was to get comfortable being uncomfortable. Yes. And a lot of times when we drink, when we use whatever, whatever your vice is, right? Yeah. Um, whenever we're doing that, we're doing it because we're uncomfortable and we don't want to feel what we're supposed to be feeling. And when we can learn to feel those extreme feelings through adventures and um, being uncomfortable outdoors, then I think that opens the door for us to be able to feel it in our everyday normal lives. And yeah. so things get hard. We're less likely to reach for whatever it is that we, we used to. And then um, now we're learning, you know what? I had a hard day. I'm going to go rock climb. I've had a hard day. I'm going to go yeah. for a run or something. Yes. Like that. Something a lot more productive than doing the old yeah. drink ski. Yeah. It reminds me of uh, like, you remember the movie fight club where Edward Norton's character mentions, he's like, after I've been in these fights, the rest of the, everything, all the volume gets turned down in my life. And I, I view mm -hmm. that at two degrees. Like I've done a couple of fairly substantial hikes in mm -hmm. my time. And afterwards, it's kind of like my moon landing, right? Well, like if I can do that hike, certainly I can, you know, fill in the blank, get through this day at work or fill in the blank, like different things. Like now I have this like completely new threshold of what I can experience and be comfortable with. Right. So, uh, yeah, super important. I'm glad you, uh, you, you mentioned that. So that's really cool. What is the, uh, the importance of the group? the group setting, you know, it's like, what has it been for you? And I, I want to get into like your personal recovery story, but before we do just let's, uh, cause I, that stood out to me when you were mentioning that in your early dialogue, there is just, uh, doing things in a group. So what in a group setting in recovery and in an adventure, what, what's the importance of that? Good question. Um, so human nature is that we need community, right? No matter as much as we like to identify as extroverts or introverts, whatever it is, we need community. Um, we need those people that we surround ourselves with. And I, I'm sure you've heard this, like, you're the average of the five people that you're closest to, right? And if the five people that you're closest to are, are consistently partying and, you know, not really leveling up or encouraging growth, then you're going to find yourself living very similar um, to those people. And so this this allows you the opportunity to get around people where the conversations are now different. The conversations are, are no longer about the next party or mm. uh, you know the, the things that you've done while you were partying, but it, it's, it's different. It's talking about growth. It's talking about challenges. It's talking about our feelings and mm. the hard things that we don't, yeah. you think these aren't normal conversations, but when we get in that community of like-minded people who are looking to level up and grow, 
um, you'll see you start to to level up and grow as well. So I'm a huge advocate for having community and and making sure you're surrounding yourself with those good positive people. Um, I think a lot of times when we're going through recovery, right, we're surrounded by these the people that we've used to do our normal activities with and um having to change your life completely which is what you you do have to do to be successful uh, is a tough concept for a lot of people because you don't want to lose those relationships but if they're not you they're they're hurting you in the end absolutely you know that out of all the people that i've talked to and worked with and myself included part of my story was definitely that was such a uh there's some mm-hmm. grief, there's some grief involved with that, isn't there? Cause you're, you are losing, like, I still love all the, you know, the, my old crew that I used to hang out with. And if I were to see them out in public, you know, I'd give them a big mm-hmm. hug and, you know, we'd have a conversation and such. Uh, fact is though, I had to pull myself out of certain circles of friends and it right. too, because of everything you just mentioned. Right. And, you know, I think right. that's, that's the biggest challenge for a lot of people. Yes. There's these emotions that we're not familiar with. Before that, though, there there is like the setting yourself up for success, and and that comes with finding different people to hang out with. And yes, there's a grieving process. Uh, mm-hmm. It's almost like a, a new identity that you take on, or a new side of yourself that you start, like you say, leveling up with. And yeah, there's some grieving that comes along with that, isn't there? Let me ask you though, if those people um, that your old crew that you used to hang out with, if they were to come to you now with a different mindset, would it look different? Would it look different oh. if they to talk to you now about growing and, and leveling up? Um, would, would you be willing to have a different type of relationship with them? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and there is elements of that. And that's, <laughs> I, that's a whole nother conversation too, because you know, I think that there's a degree of, and it happens in circles of friends where the first, there's like the first person that does it. And then there's three <laughs> other people that are like, oh, really? Sure. You've been, do- how's that been working? You know, they're curious about it. And then yeah. there's a couple more people that are like, perhaps like, blah, 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 you know, a little projectiony <laughs> about it. Right. So there definitely is oh. that. And I have had when people reach out to me, uh, asking about that type of thing. And of course, yeah, absolutely. I'll hundred percent be there. And it's, it does, it, it warms my heart, my Grinch heart, you know, when that happens and it's, yeah. So it's cool knowing that like, I'm viewed as that person in that circle and that, yeah, absolutely. They, they feel comfortable enough to still come to me and go with like a growth mindset style question or like, Hey, how is this working for you and such? So to answer your question, yeah, absolutely. And it's a beautiful thing when that happens. You're encouraging the level up, which is good yes. because not and they and they won't right but there will be people who want to and and that thing is you can still love the people that you were surrounded with um you can love them with distance and Mm -hmm. then when they need to level up it's fine to let them back in as long as they're willing to to rise to the occasion right and not try to bring you (laughs) yeah yeah so like exactly well well put i always look at it like recovery i'm just like obsessed with uh like joseph campbell's like the hero's journey I don't know if you're overly familiar with it. Okay. It's, it shows up in so much fiction. Like, okay. So like Luke Skywalker is the hero's uh, Neo from the matrix, like uh, Alice in Wonderland. So basically there's this idea it's in three phases. So the first phase is you realize, and it's, it goes with recovery and adventure to me as well. Uh, There's the first phase where you have an awareness or you realize that you have to cross this threshold. Like life will never be the same again. And that's for me is like deciding to sober up. Right. So you cross Mm -hmm. that threshold. There's no real going back at that point. Right. So that's phase one. So that's like the calling they call it Uh, phase two is like the dark night of the soul where you're really getting into yourself and realizing and processing and integrating all these different patterns that were very subconscious, perhaps childhood traumas and such, and really developing yourself. And that's like early sobriety into, you know, early sobriety into a couple of years, perhaps. Mm -hmm. And then phase three is you have learned all these new life skills. And I, like you talked about human nature, I think is to share that, right. As soon as I have leveled up and I'm like, it's working for me and I've proven it and I I can be consistent with it. I'm Mm -hmm. so enthusiastic to share it with other people and see (laughs) and help them. So it's like going back to to square one and then Mm -hmm. helping people through that whole journey. And that's how it just substantiates itself. Right. And, um, substantiates the right word there uh sustains itself there we go uh so that's where i view it like i'm i'm 
ready to go back and, and grab people and, and walk and, and help them through. And that's what the whole coaching aspect comes in for me. Uh, so yeah, I say that to say, I'm not really sure I was going with that. I just wanted to like throw that in there. Anyways, the, the hero's journey, look it up. I think you'd be, it's a, there's actually a great documentary uh, you can view on YouTube for free called finding Joe. And it's okay. like, it's everything like the hero's journey, how it shows up in popular culture. And it's just been like a, yeah, it's, it's a whole thing. And I think you dig it just because of like what obviously you're into like adventure and in recovery. So I think you really, <laughs> really dig it. So, and for anybody <laughs> listening as well. <laughs> I've never heard it called the hero's journey, but it is a, it's a topic of conversation often in our house because we talk oh. about the hard parts, right? You always yeah. are going through something hard, but then when you level up, right, there's this period of um, non-growth is it's like the bliss period, right? Everything seems to be flowing. I call it the flow state. That's what it is. Yeah. Um, it just seems really smooth, but I always remind my husband, my daughters, I'm always like, um, just know that right now it's easy because, yeah. and you enjoy this, that's it's mm. to be enjoyed. It's to be fruitful and good, but the, the next growth stage is coming. So yes. be ready. Yes, yes, yes. And back to, you know, what we were mentioning before, growth state for me, growth is like, if I remember grow, like I had like, I was a really small kid at grade eight and then had this mag- massive growth spurt. Yeah. And it was like uncomfortable, right? Like when kids are teething, <laughs> like growth is uncomfortable, right? Yeah. That's, that's the nature of it. It's so like you mentioned getting comfortable with the uncomfortable and, mm-hmm. and just realizing if just familiarizing yourself with that and not, and like leaning into it as opposed to my previous, you know, resisting it or numbing it. You know what I mean? So for sure, for sure. Super mm-hmm. cool. I'm loving this conversation. I um I want to give you a chance though, Diana, to go back in time a bit as far back as you care to go. Um, and you know, floor is yours. I want to hear your origin story as far as your relationship with alcohol or drugs and alcohol, whatever it may have been for yourself. Mm-hmm. And just walk us up into um, you know, what you know, basically where you are today. Okay, good question. We actually were just talking about this the other night. My 16-year-old daughter, she comes in and she says, tell me stories about when you were in high school. And uh, nice. I think a very mundane high school life, right? Yeah. And, <laughs> so I, I told her about the first time that I had a drink. And there's two moments, and I don't know which came first, um, but I do remember them both so vividly. And we used to have a houseboat at a lake, and it was a bunch of boats parked on a dock and we went every weekend and it was so fun. Um, but it also left the room for a little bit of trouble because we'd go to whatever boat the parents weren't on. Um, (laughs) there were cabinets of alcohol. And, um, I remember very vividly at one point, one girl that I was friends with, she was my age as well. We were 15, I think 14 or 15. And she said, do you want a pina colada? And I was like, Oh, what's a pina colada? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And, well, um, I'll make you one. And I said, okay. And of course it was delicious. It had coconut rum in it. And my goodness, that stuff was yeah. so funny. <laughs> and so that, I remember just gulping it down and being like, let's make another one. Um, yeah. yeah. Probably been a sign that I liked it a little bit too much, but it wasn't. <laughs> um, there's another memory that, you know, is a little bit less exciting. And my parents had just gotten into a pretty bad fight. My dad left. We're at the lake again. Mm. And my left and I remember saying to my mom I was like can I have um a drink right and she said sure because she she was mad she was hurt I think there were a lot of emotions going on for her and it was kind of that like fuck it attitude and and I get it I I don't know um I I understand and there's no like animosity there right but Mm -hmm. we did out there and we had a beer and I did not like that as much beer is not my (laughs) yeah (laughs) Um, from there, I just kind of developed the the party girl personality where I, I was a great time. I, I like to have fun. I like to drink on the weekends. I didn't drink by myself. I didn't drink um, every day. It was, but I did look forward to the weekends and trying to find it. It was like a game. It was mm. and rebellious and I loved every minute of it. And um I, I did when I drank, I just drank too much. And that's the, the big problem I had was it wasn't often, but when I did it, I went balls to the wall. I did not. (laughs) Um, and it was, it was fun and not to glorify it. Right. But, but that's it is like, it's the personality that I developed. And so I got married at a very, well, I got 
had my daughter at a very young age and then got married at a young age and we moved to um he was in the military so we moved to Tennessee and then we moved to Colorado and then I remember again like for me I didn't think I had a drinking problem <laughs> I, I had a I like to have fun problem but I don't think that was that bad and so um but I remember my that there were points where he would drink a little bit often and for me I was like you can't just have a drink on a weeknight as soon as you get home from work like that's weird and so I think that's where I started to kind of question myself in those moments of well how can I say something if I'm doing doing this thing right and so Mm. we we eventually did get a divorce and when I became single, I was living in Colorado, no family. Um, and I didn't really have friends because he was in the military my Mm. life. I had no identity of my own. Um, so in order to make friends and find some sort of way, I went back to what I knew best and it was time like go to parties. And I, I fell very quickly back into that party girl mentality, on the weekends um, and just a a little promiscuous and, and just having a good time, but I didn't think it was a problem. Mm. Um, And as I started, I think I was 27 or 28 when I got a divorce and started um, partying pretty hard again. And, and then I started having these thoughts of, I don't feel good the next day Mm. I'm waking up and my I'm not gonna lay in bed I didn't sleep in I I Mm. had a hamper but I had my daughter still to take care of and so I would get up the next day and we would go hiking and (laughs) I I was like I don't know what this bothered me and then slowly I just started to realize I didn't want to drink and snowboard I didn't want to drink and rock climb I still wanted to do all these things because I was finding a way with a really great group of friends and they were so amazing and they were showing me how to do all of these things right snowboarding and rock climbing and mm. we were I was really getting outside of my comfort zone but not needing alcohol because alcohol would potentially injure me pretty bad and so yeah started to really rethink that a lot of that and drinking less and this is where I kind of um, battle a little bit with imposter syndrome because for me, I think to myself, am I in recovery? Am I mm. like, what is this? Okay. You know? Yeah. I, I The more that I talk to people, I think there are some people that battle with this because I don't have a tragic story that goes with my drinking other than I just partied a little bit too yeah. much. But, sure. but slowly I started to just fade it out. And slowly I started to just say, I don't want to drink today. This doesn't sound mm. like... Yeah, I do want to still go out and be around people, but can we go uh, camping instead? Can we go hike mm. a four instead? And mm-hmm. um, luckily, again, I had a really great group of friends that yeah. they, they fostered that environment and they were consistent about growing and um, always leveling up. We were never complacent. And so mm. I'm grateful for them. They're, they are some of my most favorite people and I still pray to pray for them to this day. Yeah. Um, but I think for, so then fast forward to two years ago when I met my husband, I was drinking not very often, maybe one drink every few months. Like mm. that, it wasn't a lot. But when I met him, um, we sat down to have uh, chips and guac. And <laughs> I said, you know, tell me your story. And he started to tell me just kind of the general overview. And it was about 30 seconds into it. I was like, no. I want to hear like the ugly stuff. Tell me the really bad stuff so that I know if I like keep hanging out or not. And he (laughs) he kind of laughed and he's like, okay. And he told me in his, he has such a beautiful story. Um, And I just sat there and I, I, I immediately was like, yeah, this is what I want. And I know that I'm not, my story is nowhere near the same as his, but I don't know if it makes it any less than this is what I battle with. And maybe you can speak on this. I don't know how you feel, but because my story isn't the same as some people who go to meetings or things like that. um, Some of them have such tragic stories and I battle with sometimes thinking that my story isn't good enough, but Mm. I I think it is. I think I'm okay. Yeah, Yeah, sure. (laughs) Yeah. But um, 
anyway, so when after that conversation, I was just like, yeah, I'm done. I'll be sober too. Like, this is fun. And I, I look forward to this and we'll see what happens with our relationship. But I am done drinking and yeah. uh, whatever else. And so that's that's the gist of the story there. <laughs> yeah, I love that. Thanks for sharing that. You know, and it's that is I mean, that's. Yeah, that's the other side of of sobriety or recovery, right? Is especially if you go into um like a recovery room, um, if there, you know, it's if there is like um ego shows up, there is like a degree of comparison. And I think yeah, it's human nature uh as well, is like for to judge and compare. That's just what mm -hmm. we do. It's it's I think to me it's like what what you do with that, what you choose to do with the judgment, or if you're going to attach yourself to that judgment, if it is a negative one, or if there's a comparison, and are you going to attach to that, or just kind of let it, let that mm -hmm. thought kind of go through, right? You know, mm -hmm. and it's like I get it because like there have there there are some people that have, you know, they didn't have you know a particular rock bottom moment and whatnot. I go well, it, yeah, like and I can see where you're coming from with that, mm -hmm. but honestly, it's like it's, it's for me, it's the same way as like you know when people. When you talk about trauma, trauma right. is like perceived threat. And there's going to be like, yes, there's going to be a traumatic story of like somebody that was perhaps beaten as a child. And then there's somebody that was like four years old and told mm -hmm. in a stern way that affected them in such a way, uh, you know, maybe the parent was having an off day and, you know, it was just verbal, but it's like something that echoes into their adulthood. Again, it's like the perceived threat. It was the context is everything, right? So mm -hmm. I think I think that's what it is with recovery as well. There's no, um, you know, better or or worse or anything. It's all our each other's stories, and we're all having a shared experience in that sense. So if you can remove yourself, if if I can remove myself from the idea that I'm separate, the whole idea right. for me of recovery is that connection piece that we've been talking about, right? So, but I, I get it. Like I totally understand where you would be like, well. It's not like, you know what I mean? Like I didn't have a DUI or something like that for sure. And I'm sure there's other parts of you that do realize and validate yourself. Like your true self knows that absolutely your story is completely worth it and worthwhile. If, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, well, it, and again, I think it's just part of that growth process of learning. It, it's imposter syndrome, right? Um, yeah. It, it, you know, if people lose weight, right? The person that loses 200 pounds, everybody's like, whoa. And then the right. person like five pounds they are like, okay <laughs> yeah yeah right yeah I that person that's you know lost lost less and it it sometimes yeah it it battle or it's an inner battle of well does that truly mean that I'm in recovery I mean I'm sober but people yeah. talk talk about it and and I my heart hurts for them but then other times I'm like well because it, it did it wasn't this thing that I constantly thought about does that make it less it's right. not Thing that I'm like, oh, I'm going to drink again, you know, or, or I've had a hard day. I want to drink. I don't think about those things. So does that make me less than, yeah. um, and that it's, it's a battle. I don't know. I'm assuming most people do have this battle. And I, I think, I think so because I've talked to, again, my husband about some, uh, some people that he's, he's kind of talked to or people that are in recovery that are, um, getting ready to come up on the one year mark. Right. And that sometimes messes with a lot of people, the closer yeah. they get a lot of times they'll out of it out mm -hmm. of recovery because they they battle with that imposter syndrome of like what does it matter what does the one yeah. year mark matter and then they they just fall out because they get I yeah. don't know maybe it is imposter syndrome for them but that's kind of what I compare it to <laughs> definitely yeah you know that one year mark is like it's um it kind of fuck it fucks with people you know I've had a few folks that have gone <laughs> through my my program that specifically that one year mark is like you know, because there's a good chance that those days leading up to that one year mark, there was probably something that happened. I mean, there's a good yeah. chance that there's was, there was a reason why you sobered up that day, right? So there's this whole like, you know, the oh. body remembers what the mind forgets. So all of a sudden there's these like energies coming up in the body. There's these mm -hmm. mood swings that it's almost like you're reliving a bit of that. And, um, and then when you come to the day of Sometimes it's a bit anticlimactic, right? You're like, and then there's like the whole what's next thing. So what mm -hmm. do you do? What do you choose to do with the what's next? And that's where that complacency part can come in. If you just like rest on your laurels, complacency yeah. is one of the most dangerous things in sobriety, right? When you just feel like, ah, I got a year under my belt, I'm cured or whatever it may lead to, right? <laughs> Whereas yeah. if you can go the other way, well, what's next? Okay, well, what really, I'll have my feet 
you know, in sobriety and recovery. And then what can I do beyond that? And that's what the whole idea of my podcast beyond recovery is like. And then that's why, you know, when having guests like yourself, where you can talk about, okay, what is really like appealing to you? Something you've always wanted to do. And a lot of times uh, there is, there's like a hike or there is rock climbing or whitewater rafting or something like that. Right. So to me, <laughs> it's just such a natural extension of sobriety is to get into, you know, uh, that sort of adventure side of things. So yeah, really cool. I you're on to something about um, it being things that happened the year prior leading up to that date. Right. I think that's 100% true. And yeah. we probably realize it because there will be days that I have tough emotional days. And I'm like, what is wrong with me? Why am I? Yeah. Even right? And then I think about I'm like, oh, today is this date that happened that this like yeah. really so great thing happened. Right. <laughs> yeah. And it's like your body remembers that. And then you're kind of, you have to, there's a delayed reaction in your mind. You're like, oh yeah. Okay. No, I, now I remember. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. 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 I, uh, one final note, I, I'm going to see if I can articulate this properly. I went to a, a, a recent event down in Sedona. It was called, um, uh, oh, it's such a gorgeous spot. Um, it was, uh, it's, it was, about, it's, what was it like inner freeing children inside and out so the whole proceeds went to operation underground to help uh children like child trafficking and preventing that and then we were all doing inner inner child work on ourselves and um there was a lady that raised her hand and got the microphone all that and she was saying like how can we you know be here and we're so privileged and we're you know we're talking about saving children but we're in this you know what i mean doing the whole like we're in this warm area we're safe how can mm -hmm. i resolve that in my brain and uh and kyle kyle cease is like was he was facilitating it and he said you know it's like if you are imposing that upon yourself like you're feeling that uh you know the the pain and everything you're taking some of that on of these children and if mm -hmm. you're doing that to yourself and your own inner child and you're limiting yourself and not allowing yourself to live the, the best life that you can be, not mm -hmm. only are you imprisoning your own inner child, you're also taking on some more of that, like that negative, like lower vibrational stuff. And yeah. it's like, you know, if, if, if those children could see you and you're like trying to be a martyr for them or not living your own life, like you're not doing yourself a, mm -hmm. a good deed and you're not raising the vibration of the collective consciousness gets a little bit, you know, woo woo or unity and that sort of thing. But, it, but if you're not doing like the best that you can with what you have in your story and getting out of that imposter syndrome and getting out of that, you know, darker side of comparison and such, um, then you're not helping them and you're not helping yourself. Like, and right. yeah, so it was obviously it was a lot more articulate <laughs> than I was, but, uh, but no, yeah. Great. <laughs> yeah, that whole idea, right? So when you're, yeah, just a, just something for food for thought, because I think there is a lot of people, you know, myself included, that have gone through that whole, well, you know, there's always somebody worse. Like, am I really that bad? You know, like, do I, you know, the imposter syndrome is very real, isn't it? Yeah. So I will say the the year to year and a half before meeting my husband, I was I had taken that year to really do a lot of self work, and it was a lot of working through things that had hurt me in the past that I still carried resentments towards and yeah. sitting with it and I, I I was feeling a feeling I was gonna sit there with it until I could release it and yeah. I spent it was a year or two a year and a half I forget exactly how long but it was hard and yeah. just thinking to myself when it's finished then I'll be ready to move on to the next thing and yeah. and have a good full life and heart full of love and joy to be able to offer to people um as as openly as possible and sure enough once i had worked through like my final thing um, yeah did he introduced me to my husband and beautiful. it was it was such a beautiful process and um i highly encourage i think people call it shadow work is what shadow it's called work yeah <laughs> yes yeah um, so doing that, and I remember hearing it and thinking to myself, well, what does that mean? Mm. What are these people talking about doing shadow, right? And yeah. I, I did it, and it was, oh, it's beautiful. It's hard. It's not for the faint of heart. Um, yeah. Highly, highly encourage everyone to give it a go because I think it does open you up to be able to, yeah, help those that need help and right. um, fully love and be bring your like full expression of yourself to the table. Yeah, absolutely. I, w when you were doing that shadow work, like what was, what were some of the things that you were doing, whether it was, 
was it journaling? Did we, was it breath work, meditation? Like what were some of the tools that you were using to get to that stage? That's a good question. Um, so yes, journaling, um, I, mostly gratitude journaling and every day I would make a list of 20 things that I was grateful for. And those could be things that I already had, but it could also be things that I wanted to have. Mm. Um, so I added both of those to the list and, and, so sometimes it would be like healthy love. I didn't necessarily have that in my life at the time. And I wasn't necessarily bringing that to the table at the time, but uh. I, I, I would say already just say like, I was grateful for it. Um, it was always on the list. And then, you know, being debt free was on the list and I definitely was not debt free. <laughs> um, yeah. Those things that, but also the things that I did already have, like my daughters and um, I did have gas in my tank and uh, clean water, these things that also were on the list. And so every day, the first thing that I would do is make that list. Um, meditation was huge. Yoga, I was taking as much time to just be quiet because um, mm. I would re like repeat in my head was I need to get quiet to live mm. loud. In order for Ooh. me to to do the things in life that um, yeah. I'm called to do, I'm going to need mm. to be quiet and start listening. Mm. So that was it. And um, then the people or the things that I had resentments towards that I had emotions towards, mm. I would, I would think about them. And then I would just keep thinking about them until I was okay. And so sometimes that would be a, a long stint of just being very tearful and, yeah. uh, sad and all of it but I knew I needed to sit with those emotions and you cannot end them early you can't say I, I don't want to feel this anymore I'm getting up I'm going for a mm -hmm. walk whatever you do to not have to feel those hard feelings but you have to really get through the whole feeling and then mm. once it's done. <laughs> yeah right but <laughs> that's uh yeah a couple of questions that uh, that come up for that is like and I love that um you know that that mantra that you came up with I have to get silent what what do you like in that to you because like I know I have a certain voice that shows up for me sometimes that I swear is something beyond my normal inner dialogue like there is a voice and I always think it's like maybe my group my I, I think it's like my gramps on my mom's side like I was he, he passed away when I was like 18 and I was really looked up to him and had a special connection with him and he was a very outdoorsy. So I just feel very connected with him. So for whatever reason, I've, I've deemed that voice is like my gramps, uh, you know, yeah. so guiding me. Do you have something like that? Or like, what, how do you, um, what's your take on like that in, intuitive voice that may show up as like a mantra or like something like that? Or do you view that it's just like yourself listening to yourself or how, yeah, it's, what's your take on it? Um, that's a good question. I don't know, because you do hear, hear of people, I battled with this for a long time. I don't know where your religion stands, but um, for me, I battled with a lot of people say, oh, well, God will speak to you. God will tell you. Um, I I have never heard this voice in my head that's saying, yeah. <laughs> I am, for yeah. me, that was so hard because uh, I was like, I'm doing everything that I'm supposed to be doing to have a good relationship with God. Why don't I hear this burning bush voice? Like, where yeah. is it? <laughs> <clears throat> Finally, I realized that not everyone is the same. And for me, it was a little bit different. Do I hear a voice in my head? No, but I repeat the words in my head. So it, it's mm. me. But God does talk to me, but in a different way. So I set yeah. up a this thing where I decided on a universal symbol, right? And if I mm. saw people, then I would know that um, I am right where I'm supposed to be. And that's what cool. I would say to myself whenever I would see the symbol. And so I, I say, okay, I'm going to choose purple flowers. Purple flowers are, it, it's fine. And I'll just, yeah. and that's what I'll go with. And sure enough, um, uh, whenever I am questioning if I am where I should be, those will show up. And then I just say that to myself, I, I am right where I'm supposed to be. And Beautiful. so- yeah, it's a gentle yeah. reminder. I made yeah. my daughter choose one so that now <laughs> yeah. like, that's how you know is it's right where you're supposed to be. So do I have that booming voice? No, but do yeah. I just voice? No, because I think that everybody is different. And some people yeah. have that. Yeah. I'm just <laughs> Yeah. Well it's it's and you know what? I think because it, it's just as people are different learners or people have certain favor, certain senses. Like I'm very visual, right? That's why I have meditation. I have to have a blindfold on. Otherwise I'm going to be like visual <laughs> cues all over the place. So distracted yeah. easily. 
So I, I imagine that's the same way for the way that intuition can work, right? And perhaps that you're, yeah, and I don't know, like perhaps you're more of a, a visual person or something, and then you can interpret that and then you have a mantra or something you say underneath it. So yeah, like you say, I think it's, it doesn't necessarily have to be that Morgan Freeman voice of like the, you're, you are in the right spot, you know what I mean? <laughs> it would be sweet yeah. if it was, but yeah. <laughs> um, uh, I will say, so my daughter asked me this really interesting question. And I, so now I'll ask you, how do you dream when you dream? Do you see yourself in the dream mm. now? Or are you yourself through your own eyes seeing it? Yeah. What is um, I'd say like 99% <laughs> of the time, it's like me first person, like seeing it through my eyes. Yeah. How about yourself? Me too. But yeah. my daughter, she watches it like it's a movie and she wow. sees it. Yeah, so people are different in that way too. Yeah, interesting. And even yeah. one step further, which I found interesting, is there are some people, uh, from what I hear, uh, mm -hmm. that don't have like really busy inner dialogue. Like they have memories as more of just like, you know, like moving pictures, if you will, right? And they don't really attach like narrative to it, which I yeah. thought incredibly shocking because I have like five or six narratives going on at any given time. I'm cutting myself off. You know what I mean? Because yeah. like I don't have to finish the sentence because I know where I'm going with it. So I'll have like a half sentence and then another voice comes in. And, you know, <laughs> it feels like I have like three or four voices going in at any given point. And then, yeah, I've, I've heard a few different spots where like people will have oh, perhaps they have, um, but they more favor like actual moving pictures, if you will, like uh, yeah. theater of the mind versus the narrative, which I'm like, whoa, that'd be <laughs> so trippy. Like, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> That's so, yeah, that's cool. That's cool. Um, yeah, I'm enjoying this conversation. Just kind of being respectful. We both have our, our calls coming up. We've got about yeah. seven minutes to wrap things up, but yeah, I've been really enjoying this conversation. Uh, there's so many different topics that we could, we could go into if we have a, have you back on the show sometime, which I'd love to, um, especially now that I know what you guys are planning and everything. I want to have you as like, uh, yeah, let's do a little like collaboration thing for sure. Let's, mm -hmm. I'd love to continue to watch your guys' business grow. And if you ever want to do a, um, you know, a, a episode with your husband on, and I would love to have him on as well. It would be super I, cool. Um, great story. And I, I tell him all the time, I'm like, it's one of my most favorite to listen to because his yeah. growth is so beautiful. It's, I, I'm a huge advocate for growth. So I'm, yeah. I tell I feel blessed to have been able to watch you. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. I noticed the girl, and actually one of the words that I wrote down, there's a couple, you know, topics to close, close things up today. And that was one of them is growth. So, and you, you, you said the magic word. So what, um, I, I imagine this is like one of your core values is like growth, like growth mindset, lifelong learning. Is that always been the case? Like, have you always been a very curious person? Uh, just any, anything to do with growth, uh, you know, just, it, yeah. What, what it means to you. Good question. Um, so it's so crazy because I feel like my life is in two parts. And in, in the beginning, it just seems like it was this very like foggy, um, kind of sad mm -hmm. existence when I was little. And then not until after my divorce did I do I feel like I, I woke up. I truly woke up to life and mm -hmm. And I'm so grateful because and I'm grateful to my ex-husband for all of the things that happened because had I not gone through all of that, I would not have been forced into such a, such a beautiful time of my life. And um, so there, there are those two sectors. And in the beginning, no, there was no growth. It was very like lost, no direction. And then the second part of life, my goodness, it's beautiful. It's wonderful. It's mm. a state of whenever things are in the flow state, I just say, I always say, I'm like, thank you for the flow state. I am grateful to be here. I am looking forward to what's next because I know it's going to be hard, but I know it will yeah. be true. And so that's, Beautiful. that's the state of when people tell me, um, I'm scared or I, I don't know if I can do this or, um, I'm sad or, or I'm mad. Right. I'm like, yes, yeah, you mm. are Feel that because yeah. that's life. Right. Yeah. When you're Scared, when you're mad, when you're sad, those are all the emotions that truly make life beautiful because after those are the really good things, right? Once you work through those, you're getting ready to, to see or do something very beautiful, yeah. but you don't or without feeling the hard first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, I love that. It's such a <laughs> amazing, I love that perspective on it. I haven't <laughs> heard somebody articulate it quite like that. Like, so the little bit of the work that I've been doing recently with my groups and with myself, of course, uh, <laughs> has been, you know, just the idea of like, getting out of the idea that 
there's an emotional hierarchy, right? So like the, there's like bad and good emotions, right? There's just, there's emotions. So instead of like, you know, sadness, mad down here and judging, like all of a sudden you're throwing like shame and judgment on those emotions and enrobing them in this like lower, the lowest of vibrations, let's face it, guilt, shame, all the stuff that really doesn't do anything for us. Right. And like encasing these emotions in that, right? And then all of a sudden they're just like, ugh, of course you're going to do whatever you can to escape and avoid and numb, right? Yeah. You know what I mean? So just this idea that like, to your point, I love how you put it there. It's just like, you want that, you know, for me, like anger, acute anger is great. And that's one that I can like let through my system burn off very quickly, you yeah. know, and feel through it. I've always been able to do that and then laugh at myself after I look very Larry David from Curb Your Enthusiasm. I get very, <laughs> right. Uh, so, yeah. But there's like the loneliness, uh, sadness, mm -hmm. um, some of those other ones like that. I am not as experienced feeling like, uh, so when I do feel a little bit like that, hollow, mm -hmm. I call it like, like a little tingly feeling throughout, like, like it's, it'd be like the equivalent of finding out that I wasn't invited to a party that I was hoping to go to or something. Just, you know, uh, like tingly, uh, right. <laughs> yeah. So when that comes up, I'm like, Oh, better check Instagram. You know what I mean? And that's my pattern that I've, I've it continued on after well after I've sobered up. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's like, yeah, feeling into that now, those mm -hmm. feelings and realizing that, okay, there to your point is like, if I can get through that, what's going to be on the other side of that. Right. Um, yeah. so yeah, that's, that's, I guess, yeah, that's where I'm with. I love how you mentioned it though. So, yeah. uh, that's beautiful. That's a beautiful way of looking at growth. Um, and I think it's good that you feel, feel those feelings because at some point you're going to have, especially as a coach, you're going to have a conversation with someone that is feeling lonely or that, it, that isn't invited to the party and you're going to yeah. be truly empathize with them and be like, Oh my yeah. gosh, like, I know how this feels and it stinks. Yeah. But you like going yeah. through is what's going to happen next. And that's, yeah, this that's is how you take control of it. <laughs> exactly. That's the, that's the best point. Like, yeah, I can coach as far as I've gone with myself. So that's why I'm really guinea pigging myself in a lot of this. And, and yeah, absolutely. At this point, I feel, I feel like there are certain things that when I hear it, Mm -hmm. Um, I'm so in it when I hear that somebody's going through it and I'm like, I'm still like 80 or 90%. I haven't fully gone with it. So then yeah. it's almost like there's a bit of trauma bonding that happens too, because I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm still going through that too. Yes. Whereas yeah, to your point, if I can, not if I can, when I get to the other side <laughs> of that, I'll be able to like, ah, yes, I you know exactly what to do here. I've done it. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, exactly. So no, another good point. Another great point. <laughs> We had talked about in the beginning too is that's the good leadership quality in you right yeah. is that wanting to go through it before yes it's like what they should be doing because yeah if it, then can you truly tell somebody how to get through it right you have a mountain can you really tell them the path to get up the mountain probably not so. probably not yeah that's yeah. right there's a wonderful ted talk on that it was like the guy um, it's like this monk and he's so like wonderful to listen to his voice is amazing. And mm -hmm. he talks about the difference between there was a guy that was about to set up, up this mountain. And he started talking to people that had gone up the mountain. And after mm -hmm. talking to 12 people, he's like, you know what? I've, I think I've got enough perspective of what that climbing that mountain is. And then he never did it. And oh. then the whole idea of like, you know, that's the difference between hearing about something and experientially doing it. And, and, uh, the whole moral story is obviously climb, climb your mountain, right. Instead of just like, <laughs> yeah. So, and on that, um, Diana, this was an amazing conversation. Let's continue it for sure. I'd love to have you back on for part two and three and four and whatever it may be after yeah. that. Uh, so when, where can people find you online, specifically your store, if they're interested in buying some of your wonderful clothing? Okay, so Instagram is at Adventure Over Addiction. Uh, the website is www.adventureoveraddiction.com. So, Brilliant. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. And yeah, let's, uh, we'll, we'll off, offline here, I'll reach out to you and we'll, we'll set up a, a part two here because I really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. All right.